Okay, this video is about the student T distribution, or just the T distribution for short. So, first thing I want to do is to uh, explain this diagram I've drawn on the board here. The blue curve is my attempt at drawing the standard normal curve, that's the Z distribution. So, the blue curve is my attempt at drawing that. Um, then you see two other curves, a red curve and a green curve. Those are actually examples of the T distribution. But what I want to emphasize here is that there isn't just one T distribution, there's a family of curves here that are associated with the T distribution. And their shape, their exact shape, is actually dependent upon their sample size in this situation. So um, the curve has something called the degrees of freedom. That's DF for degrees of freedom. Where the degrees of freedom are defined as N minus 1 when you're dealing with a situation where you want to estimate the population mean for some variable, right? So if that's the case, your degrees of freedom will be defined as N minus 1. Um, I'm not going to get into the actual detailed description of what the degrees of freedom is and why we have it, uh, because it's either a mathematical proof or more of an everyday explanation of it, but either way, I don't think either one of them is very instructive. So I think for now, you know, it's better that uh, if you want to know more about the degrees of freedom, look it up in a textbook, Wikipedia, you'll find it, of course. But for now, what I want to say is that um, there's such a thing called the degrees of freedom. It's linked to the sample size. So, for example, this curve would have had a sample size of 4 because the degrees of freedom is 3. This one would have had a sample size of 9 because its degrees of freedom was 8. Remember, degrees of freedom here is defined as n minus 1. And when we look at the curves that are produced then, we can see that in the case where the sample size was 4, the degrees of freedom were 3, this green curve has a lot more area in the tail here. It's thicker in the tails. I mean, there's more probability that a variable under that curve would get out to the extreme ends of the curve. That's going to be true on both sides. Of course, the curve is symmetric, right? For the red curve, you see that same pattern, that it's a little thicker than the blue curve, but yet it's not as thick as the green curve in the tail, right? Um, incidentally, also notice that the heights of the curves are different as well. And this is because the total area for each individual curve has to be one always, right? So if you're going to take some area, extra area and put it in the tail, you've got to take it from somewhere. It's got to come from here in the center then, right? So you end up having a drop in the total mass here that's located in the center and a little more of it applied to the tail area. The red curve, again, has that same pattern, but it's not quite as thick in the tail area, and as a result, it's much taller than the green curve and much closer to the blue curve overall. What you would see if you kept looking at different examples where the n was increasingly large, you would see that the curve here, the t-curve, start to look more and more like the blue standard normal curve, right? And what that means is that if you'd studied calculus, you would know then that the limit of the process would be that the t-distribution eventually becomes the standard normal curve. In other words, the t-distribution approaches the standard normal curve as the n approaches infinity, right? So as n gets exceedingly large, the t-curve and the z-curve are indistinguishable, right? So that will kind of bring me to um, what your teacher might say about when you should use these two curves. So there's a, a formal rule, and then there's kind of an informal rule. So let's do the informal rule first. Because of the fact that the as the sample size gets large, the t-curve approaches the z-curve. A lot of professors use this rule. They say, well, when n is 30 or higher, you can go ahead and just use the standard normal curve for those problems. When n is going to be below that value, so 29 or less, then you will use the t-distribution. So that's kind of the shortcut method that a lot of professors will use in class. In fact, in my classroom, I use that as well. However, in reality, the strict rule, and your professor may use this rule, is that if the population standard deviation is known, and you can assume that the phenomena you're looking at, say we're looking at human heights, and say we believe that human heights are normally distributed, or we have a sample size large enough that we can justify um, by the central limit theorem that human heights would be normally distributed in that situation, or x bar, and those a sample mean would be normally distributed in that situation. If we have those criteria met, so we can assume normality, and we know the population standard deviation, then we can use the standard normal curve. Why is that important? Well, this population standard deviation is a single value. If it's known, that means that when we got a different sample, it wouldn't change, right? Because even though the sample itself would have a sample standard deviation, that wouldn't matter because we'd know the population value and we would just use that as the measure of variation for the problem. In the case of um, the T distribution, we would assume that, again, normality is known to be true. So we'd say we think that the phenomena we're working with is normally distributed. So maybe we're dealing with human heights again, and we have a sample size that's large enough to assume that human heights are normally distributed. 
So for the t-distribution, we assume normality as well, but we don't know the population standard deviation. And the reason why, again, that's important is because for every sample that we have, for every specific sample, we would be forced to rely upon that sample standard deviation as an estimate of the population standard deviation, which means depending on the sample, we'd have a different standard deviation. So you could tell that you know, the problem would be very dependent on that. If one guy collected one sample and calculated and his, did his work, he would have a different measure of standard deviation than we would have if we had a different sample. So even if we're studying the same phenomena, we have the same sample size, um, we'd end up having different results because of the fact that we have a different standard deviation. And of course, we'd also have different sample means, but that's okay because the sample mean is um, a variable we expect to be varying when we're estimating the population mean. But we don't expect this guy to vary because in theory, we'd say, well, we know the population standard deviation, and the only thing we're trying to estimate is the population mean. If we're using x-bar to do that, then you know, it's okay that x-bar varies but it's not okay if this varies, so to compensate for that, we use the t-distribution, right? But, so let's recap real quick, just to, because that might have been all a little bit confusing. The recap, the simple idea is this. Some classes will say when the sample size is large, use the standard normal curve, and the sample size is small, use the t-distribution. The cutoff between large and small would be 30, so 30 and higher, use the z, under 30, use t, right? In other classrooms, they will say, in order to use z or t, you first have to know that the distribution is normally distributed, and then the choice between z and t depends upon this guy, the population standard deviation. If you know it, you can use z. If you don't, you use t. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention is just the real world. Um, most people in the real world, when they use uh, statistics in the real workforce, they use software to do the calculations, and most software packages use the t distribution. And they do that because, and I think it's justified, because essentially they know when the sample size is very large, there's very little difference between uh, t and z, right? That's one issue. And the other issue is, in reality, you hardly ever know the population standard deviation. So um, you might as well pretty much always use the t distribution. If the sample size is very large, then, of course, the z distribution um, and the t would be very similar to one another, so it wouldn't make much of a difference.